Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to our online academy. My name is Erin and I'm joining you today from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. Now if you are watching us live, that is Friday morning, it's 10 a.m. Pacific time, then we're going to put a number up here. You can text us at this number and we can answer your questions right here live on the air. So you're going to text us here, 562-286-1838. Now if you're watching this on YouTube at a later date, you can also email us your questions here at live at lbaop.org and we'll make sure to get back to you within a couple of days. So we'd love to hear from you. We want to hear all of your questions because today we are taking a very special behind the scenes look at how we build and design one of our exhibits here at the aquarium. So if you have any questions at all about um, what it things go into building our exhibits, um, what we have to consider, how we do it, how we care for our exhibits, um, how we care for the animals in them, anything like that. This is our chance. We're going to get a lot of behind the scenes footage. So you're going to see what it's like to run an aquarium. Have any of you ever had an aquarium at home? Um, maybe you've had a fish tank or a goldfish, betta fish, anything like that. If so, you know that these exhibits take a lot of work to care for. So we're going to be taking a look at some of those things that we have to consider. Consider. And we're going to take a look at my favorite type of exhibit. And those are the exhibits that have live coral in them. Have you ever cared for a live coral exhibit? If so, you know that it takes a ton of work. So we have people, um, maybe home hobbyists, that keep aquariums like this one. And they're able to care for these animals, care for the coral. And it takes a lot of work. So here at the aquarium, we have an entire team of our staff. They're called our husbandry staff. And they care for the animals. Now, the ones taking care of our corals and fish are called aquarists. And um, they will have a couple of exhibits that are assigned to them. And they will spend their entire work work week caring for those couple of exhibits. So keeping them clean, keeping the water quality excellent, um, keeping the animals fed, making sure the animals are healthy, um, giving them any medication they might need. These are all the things that they have to consider in order to care for their exhibit. So what we're going to do is we're going to be basically building an exhibit like this all the way from the ground up. So what are the things that we have to think of? What are the things we have to do in order to care for the exhibit? And then we'll be able to imagine adding animals to them. So the first thing that we do when we're designing an exhibit is we have to figure out what that exhibit is going to look like. So we want to take a look at um, those sorts of habitats in the ocean and try to figure out what those habitats look like. So we're going to be visiting a coral reef in the ocean and we're going to see what it is that we notice about that coral reef. Now this is taken by a scuba diver so you'll notice it's a little bit, uh, there's a lot of movement in this video. But here this is a coral reef in the ocean. What are the things that you see here? I'm noticing a couple different things. First off I'm noticing all of this coral Look at this enormous coral head. We also have some soft coral here in the background. So we've got different types of coral. And if you look all the way back into the very, very background, there's a lot of different types of coral. So we're seeing um, a variety of types of coral, um, different shapes, different sizes, different colors, even different um, builds, basically, whether they're soft or hard. And just like in this exhibit, you'll notice that there's a lot of um, fish, different types of fish. Um, what do you notice about this fish? All these fish in here. They're different sizes again. Most of them are a little bit smaller though. We don't have a lot of really large fish in this habitat. We may occasionally see larger fish coming in to visit coral reefs, but the animals that live full time on the coral reef are typically gonna be a bit smaller. They're also gonna be really colorful. So we've got some pinks, we have some yellows, we have some blues. And that's something we see about this exhibit as a whole is that it's really, really bright and colorful. So that's one way that we are able to um, kind of observe this habitat and see what we notice about this habitat. Here's another look at a coral reef in the ocean. I see also there's a lot of rocks on this coral reef. So the, there's rocks and then the coral builds on top of it. Um, we see some other types of invertebrates like sea anemones and sea urchins existing here. Um, this particular one you can see has a lot less live coral. So, but since we're building our own exhibit, we can add as much or as little live coral as we want. Um, I also notice that the water here is really clear. So if we're looking for coral reefs, we're gonna be traveling to warm tropical areas. 
So those warm tropical areas are going to be places like Hawaii, Florida, Southeast Asia, Australia, um, places around the equator where the water is going to be really warm, um, but also we're going to see that the water is very, very clean. Clear. So here in California, we have a lot of nutrients in our water. We have a lot of plankton. We have a lot of stuff in our water that makes it um, really conducive to having a lot of life in our water. Um, but when we visit, and that's why our water sometimes isn't like that bright blue tropical clear water that you see in tropical places. But when we visit coral reefs, we'll see that the water is very clear. There's not a ton of nutrients in the water. There's not a ton of plankton in the water. It's a lot of really clear water, and that's really important for the coral. We'll talk a little bit more about that. We did get our first question. Make sure you're texting all your questions in here. Um, the question is, how much live coral do you have at the Aquarium of the Pacific? That's a great question. So for many, many years here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we had one live coral exhibit. We'll see if Talia can put a picture or a video up of that live coral exhibit. Um, and that live coral exhibit has grown with us at the aquarium since we opened over 20 years ago. And so um, that coral has grown and it's really filled that exhibit. So it looks really, really beautiful. Um, over the last probably 10 years or so, though, we have slowly and strategically added live coral. This is our um, main live coral exhibit. And you'll notice that there's very little spots that don't have live coral. You can see there's this pink one here. There's yellow. There's this kind of up here. All these different shapes and colors. And they have filled this exhibit. So they basically grown and filled every little nook and cranny in this entire exhibit. Um, but like I said, we also have other exhibits that are starting to grow and starting to fill like this one is. Um, so I don't know how many there are by number or anything like that, um, but we have now several exhibits that are made completely of live coral, which is really cool. So we were talking about building our exhibit. I want to talk about the foundation of this coral reef habitat, and that's the coral itself. So what is coral? Um, what is it? What does it look like? What is it a plant? Is it an animal? Is it a rock? What do you think coral is? Uh, coral is actually an animal, and we'll see if we can get an up-close look at our coral to try to figure out a little bit more about this animal. It's related to animals like jellies and sea anemones. So if you've ever seen a sea anemone, you know that sea anemones look really similar. So what we're seeing here, this is a really zoomed-in look at this coral, and every single one of these that you see here is called a polyp. So a coral reef is made up of a bunch of different pieces of coral, and each piece of coral is made up of hundreds or thousands of individual polyps. So they're basically like a colony, and they all live together. Now, the way I like to think about these is they're kind of like an apartment. So we have um, a coral, and they build their own apartment. So um, some coral are hard corals. They build a skeleton. It's made of calcium carbonate, like a lot of shelled animals. And they basically will build this calcium carbonate home. And then other coral polyps will build on top of that home and others will build on top of that home. So that over decades or centuries, you end up creating these huge, huge structures. Um, structures like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia that can be seen from outer space. So they're these enormous structures that are created by tiny, tiny animals. So again, going back to that, apartment analogy. Um, it's basically like if each coral polyp built their apartment on top of an existing apartment building, and that's how they're able to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So they're able to exist in these really, really large numbers. Now, I mentioned hard corals, which are corals that build their own skeleton, um, and that's what you see when you see that kind of white coral um, that's often in disp on display. Um, that is what's left. That's that skeleton. But then we also have the soft coral. So these are all examples of hard coral. So you can see they are rigid. They're stiff. Um, they're not going to be moving around. They are going to be stuck in place. But what do you see? Oops. Oh, what do you see up here? Those ones are moving and those are soft corals. So those can be shaped like fans. They can be shaped kind of like fingers. Sometimes they look like plants. And those are soft corals. And those are corals that are able to move with their, um, with basically the movement of the water. So those are not skeleton building corals, um, but they are reef building corals, uh, but they are still important in that habitat. Now, how do corals eat? We've talked about the fact that they're animals. Where do they get their food from? Um, corals actually get their food from 
an algae. So living inside of each coral polyp is an algae. It's called zooxanthellae. Um, and here you can see a really close up view of these coral polyps. That zooxanthellae is an algae. And just like other algaes, they use photosynthesis. So let's take a remember back to our photosynthesis uh, chapters that we've read. What do you remember about photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is something that plants and algae do where they take the energy from the sun and they convert that energy from the sun into sugar. Remember that uh, glucose? So they convert it into sugar. Now the very special thing that's happening inside coral is that that sugar that the zooxanthellae is creating is able to be used by the coral. So they have a symbiotic relationship. The algae lives inside the coral and the algae performs photosynthesis to produce food for the coral. So that's how they're able to get their food. Now thinking about that, that means that the algae has really specific water conditions in order to survive. It needs to have clear water so that the sunlight can reach through, which is really perfect in tropical areas. Remember, they have really clear water in tropical areas. They also need to be shallow enough that the sunlight can reach them. We'll talk about deep sea corals a little bit later, um, but most corals are gonna exist in the really shallow water areas where sunlight can reach them so that the algae can perform photosynthesis. We got a couple of questions here. We're gonna take a look at some of these questions. What types of coral do we have here at the aquarium from London? Thank you, London. Um, we've got lots of different types of corals. We have um, several hard corals. We also have soft corals, and we even have some deep sea corals. Um, as far as the species, I there must be... What do you think? Hundreds of species. We probably have a hundred species of them here. I'm not totally sure on that number. So um, we've got lots of different types of corals. Uh, another question from Katie. Why do ocean animals need to make shelter in the water? Great question. So most ocean animals will have some sort of predator. And so they need a um, an area where they can hide and retreat to, to stay safe from those predators. And that's something that we will consider as we are building our exhibit is that we need to make sure that um, even if they don't have predators inside the exhibit, the fish still need a place to hide and feel safe. So if we put tropical coral reef fish like this in just a big empty exhibit, they're going to feel like they don't have a safe space to retreat to and they're not going to feel comfortable. Um, it's kind of like if you moved into a house and you just had a big empty room and you didn't have things like beds and chairs and things like that, um, it, it would be difficult for them. Um, another question, how many fish do we have here at the aquarium uh, from Sophia? Um, our largest exhibit at the aquarium has about 600 different fish in it. Um, or several of them are the same species, but we have about 600. Here at the aquarium, we have about 11,000 animals, although not all of those are fish. A lot of those are invertebrates, like sea urchins and sea stars or jellies. Um, a lot of them are also mammals, birds, other animals, but about 11,000 total. Very good. Um, so we were talking about our coral. So we've learned a little bit about coral. Now let's talk about the conditions and the things that we need in order to care for coral. So we talked about having clear, warm water. That's really, really important. Number one, clear, warm water. And that is something that we obtain through our filtration system. So filters are incredibly important when we're caring for an exhibit, especially one that has corals, because those animals are really, really sensitive to changes in the water quality. So this is a filtration an example of what our filtration might look like. A couple of things that are sticking out to me here. We have these big barrels. These big barrels are sand filters. So if you have a jacuzzi or you've seen anything like that, this looks really similar. This is basically a jacuzzi pump so what ha or a jacuzzi filter. So what happens is the water goes into this. This barrel is filled with sand. The water passes over that and the sand will basically pull out anything um, that's in the water. So things like leftover food, uh, maybe fish scales, pieces of um, like seagrass or algae that have been pulled up. Any of the big things get pulled out um, by that sand filter. We'll go back to that other picture so we can look for some other parts. Down here we saw see a lot of pumps. Everyone thinks, oh, pumps are so important when we're taking care of a fish tank. And they totally are important, but the only thing that they do is move water. So pumps are how you move water from one area to another. The pumps don't do any sort of filtering. They don't do any sort of cleaning. All they do is move the water 
through the whole system. So that's how we're able to get water going through the sand filters, going through light filters, going through other types of filters. It all happens using those pumps. Um, we have other types of filters as well. I mentioned we have UV filters. Um, UV filters will basically, uh, the water goes through a tunnel inside of these bright lights and these bright lights, these UV lights, will basically kill any sort of bacteria in the water. Um, right here, this is what's called a protein, uh, or is this bio balls? This is bio ball. This is a bio ball tower, excuse me. Um, and so bio balls are basically small um, balls that have a lot of surface area on them for healthy bacteria to grow. So in the ocean, healthy bacteria is really critical for um, basically moving water through the nitrogen cycle. So it basically moves um, toxic fish waste into things that are less toxic. And so we have healthy bacteria that grows on these balls and the healthy bacteria helps our water to basically convert fish waste, which is like ammonia or ammonium, converts fish waste into um, nitrogen prod products that are less toxic. Um, and then... Oh, Here's that protein skimmer. Um, basically, we have these bubbles that come up through the system, and those bubbles will basically bond anything organic, so anything with that carbon in it. So that helps to get rid of fish waste. So what we have happening here, it's kind of gross, but this is just basically bubbles of fish poop that come up. So um, And that fish waste, then we can just remove this whole top portion where this blue is. We just remove that whole thing, clean it out, put it back on, and that's how we're able to um, remove a lot of that waste. So basically what we end up seeing is all these different types of filters, all of them working together, and we don't have just one type of filter on any exhibit. We've got all these different filters, and that helps to keep the water clear and clean. Here's another look behind the scenes at one of our exhibits, um, and all of this helps to keep our water clear and clean so that we can make sure that um, that the animals are healthy, and that allows coral to grow. I also want to point out right here, you see all these screens and these monitors. We have monitors that look at every single one of our exhibits. So they monitor things like um, the water flow, the temperature, the pH, things like that. And if those numbers are not um, within a healthy range, then they'll alert our life support staff. We have life support staff that work here at the aquarium 24 hours a day so that if anything goes wrong, if we see any major changes in any of our exhibits, people are here to respond quickly and make sure that we're able to adjust those filters back into normal range. So that helps make sure the water is clear and um, for our, our coral. The next thing that we need to keep in mind is the light. So coral, remember we talked about coral needs bright light from the sun because the algae is performing photosynthesis. So if we just have like normal light from our rooms, uh, that is not going to be bright enough for the algae to perform the photosynthesis so our coral can grow beautifully and be healthy. Um, so instead we have special LED lights and we can actually adjust those LED lights so that they um, not only are different brightness levels, but they can change throughout the day. So maybe they will um, have things like sunset and then sunrise um, and then full daylight sun so we can manipulate them to provide the perfect optimal light so that that algae is able to produce as much food as possible. We got a couple questions. We're going to get to these questions and then we'll come back to talking about our filtration. Um, uh, Kalaya or Kalea um, is wondering, do certain animals hide in the coral? That's a really great question. Yes, we do see a lot of animals hiding in coral, especially small fish. So fish will hide in the coral because it's a really great spot to escape predators. What we end up seeing is that a lot of the animals that live on coral reefs, a lot of the fish are really, really narrow. They have, it's called compressed when their body shape is like this. Look at how all these fish are compressed. They're going to be really narrow. And that's because that allows them to fit into all these cracks and crevices. So every one of these little cracks and crevices is a really great hiding spot for these fish. And the thing that these fish all have in common is that they are all prey items. So um, they can be eaten by larger fish, by sharks. Um, by other animals, so they do hide in that coral reef. Um, let's see, Andrew is wondering, do you use blueprints to plan out exhibits? Um, so it really just depends on the exhibit. Um, all of our larger exhibits obviously are built into the blueprints for the entire aquarium, um, and a lot of those larger exhibits, in fact, cannot be 
changed uh, now that the aquarium is built. One that I'm thinking of specifically is our Blue Cavern exhibit. It's our large kelp forest exhibit. Um, when you walk into the aquarium, it's a big, enormous two-story exhibit. And it's where we house our kelp forest animals. Uh, the windows on that exhibit are about nine inches thick. So um, they were lowered into place before we put the roof on the building. So um, that one is definitely built very permanently into our exhibit. A lot of our smaller ones though, we are able to change. So sometimes every couple of years, we might decide that we want to house um, different size animals, different types of animals, so we can change the size of the exhibit, um, insert different fish tanks, that sort of thing. So there is some flexibility with that. Um, now let's go back to talking about coral. What are the things that we have to keep in mind in order to build a coral reef exhibit? Um, we talked about clear water. We talked about light. Another thing we need to think about is the flow. So we need to have the perfect level of water flow. So looking in this exhibit, we can see there's probably a little bit of water flow coming from somewhere over here. You can see the soft coral is kind of moving. Um, Coral needs some amount of water flow. If they're sitting in really still water, then uh, things can kind of rest on top of them. Things like, like sand that's been kicked up or anything like that can rest on top of them and that can be really negative for them. So they need some element of water flow. However, they can't have too much water flow. Coral doesn't usually exist in areas where there's a ton of wave movement or if there is wave movement there, um, a lot of the coral is, um, a little bit kind of broken, so it's not able to grow as large. So we have to get the perfect amount of movement. And even within one exhibit, that movement can change. So we have to maybe be, be mindful that corals that need more water movement sit right by the water output where the water is coming out. Maybe the ones that need less water movement sit further away from it. Um, very good. Another thing that we need to think about is the nutrients in the water. So corals need a couple different nutrients. The first thing that they need is calcium. So they build that skeleton out of cal it's calcium carbonate is the material. And they have to pull that calcium out of the water. So if our water doesn't have enough calcium in it, then the coral isn't going to be able to build and grow. And so we have found that having an exhibit that has more calcium in it than the ocean allows our coral to grow really beautifully. So we actually add calcium supplements into our water to help it to grow. The other thing that we need in our water is we need food. Um, so we'll take a look at our coral polyps again. And we know that the zooxanthellae creates a lot of the food for coral, um, but these polyps are also able to catch some food. So what we've learned over our years of caring for coral is that when we put food into the water, our coral is able to grow larger and more beautiful and more vibrant. So we actually add food uh, to their exhibit. Now you're wondering, what do they eat? Um, we add things like plankton, so things like copepods, um, rotifers, mycid, shrimp, and we just will either pour that into the water for them to um, suck up, or more frequently we'll take like almost like a bulb or like a turkey baster type thing, and we will actually squirt that directly on the coral so that the polyps are able to grab onto it. Now we talked about the fact that most coral has this zooxanthellae so that they're able to um, get their, their energy from the sunlight. But there is coral that lives in deeper exhibits. So coral that lives in deep parts of the ocean where the sunlight doesn't reach. Those are deep sea corals. And we do have an exhibit here of deep sea corals. Now you can imagine if you're living in a dark habitat, it's not going to be helpful to have this algae that needs the sunlight to do photosynthesis. So deep sea corals are going to be responsible for catching their own food. So they will do much more feeding using their tentacles um, than other corals will do. So for our deep sea coral exhibit, we actually have to be um, feeding them several times a day. So they might eat four to five times a day where we'll actually go in there and squirt that food directly on the individual corals to make sure that every Everyone is getting the amount of food that they need. Um, those corals will also obviously have different restrictions as far as light. The light is uh, set differently. They don't need bright daytime light because that's not what they're used to. So instead they would have light that kind of is um, specifically designed to work for their type of exhibit. So it's going to be a little bit darker, but we have to obviously light it enough that our guests can see what's in there. We got some more questions. Let's see what our questions are. Um, so Lucas is wondering what kind of homes do clownfish live in? Um, oh, here's an example of some of our deep, uh, deep water corals and anemones. Um, what kind of, of homes do clownfish live in? 
Uh, so clownfish live inside of sea anemones. Um, sea anemones are often found on coral reefs. So um, clownfish do live on a coral reef, but they live specifically inside of a sea anemone. Um, this is a sea anemone here. And they have a special mucus that covers their body that helps them to um, be able to swim through the tentacles of the sea anemone without being stung. So if we were building a clownfish exhibit, we would need to make sure that we had several of these really large sea anemones that were the proper species to be able to mix well with the clownfish that we put in the exhibit. Um, how do deep sea corals eat from Jaren? I know we covered that a little bit, but they use those tentacles to grab plankton out of the water. Um, Bailey is wondering, would fish be able to survive without coral? They would, and we will take a look at that a little bit later, but we do have several exhibits that have artificial coral in them, so fake coral. And in those exhibits, the fish are able to, um, basically they still will lay their eggs in the artificial coral. They'll still hide in the artificial coral. They still treat it like a regular coral exhibit, but it's just artificial, it's fake coral. Uh, McKenna is saying, how long does it take to build the whole exhibit? Great question, McKenna. Um, so once we have constructed the exhibit, it takes a little bit of time to add animals. And that's because we have to allow that healthy bacteria to grow. So it can take as much as a month or two months for uh, before we're able to have all of the animals that we want living in the exhibit to be living in the exhibit. So basically we'll add a couple and then the healthy bacteria starts to grow. And then we add a couple more and then that bacteria grows a little bit more more and then we add even more. Um, we can't put them in all at once because the bacteria hasn't grown enough to be able to support them. Dylan is wondering, where do we get the fish at the aquarium? Great question, Dylan. Um, so the fish that we have here at the aquarium come from several sources. Um, some of them come from uh, like suppliers that um, are able to collect them from the ocean. And for those ones, we make sure to use suppliers that source all their fish sustainably. So they're taking them in ways that don't harm the environment. And they're only taking them in quantities that are not going to be harmful. Um, we also can get some of our fish are going to be born at zoos and aquariums. And then we have a system basically for trading and exchanging them uh, among zoos and aquariums. And then some fish, especially the ones that are found here in Southern California, um, our staff will actually go out and scuba dive to collect them. Um, so it really just depends on the fish. Um, Let's see, Emily is wondering how much light do the fish need? Um, so the fish need some amount of light, but the light is a lot more important for the coral. So um, the fish could survive with just like regular lights that just light the exhibit, but the corals really need that LED lights to keep them healthy. Um, here's a view of our exhibits with artificial coral. So you can see that this coral is a little bit less vibrant, but it's basically created, um, it's like a, almost like a concrete material and then it's painted by artists to look like the real thing. So many great questions. Uh, the question, Alina's wondering, why do fish need calcium? So the calcium is actually added to the water for the coral, and that's because the, the coral pulls the calcium out of the water in order to build its skeleton. So if there's not calcium in the water, they don't have the ingredients to be able to build their skeleton. Um, do you have computers to motion sense the fish from Alana? Um, Alana, that's a great question. We do not have computers that motion sense the fish. Um, our staff will go around and watch the fish and look at the fish to see how they're doing. But we have computers that sense a lot of other things. So um, things like this one you can see is measuring the flow of the water, the temperature. That's what this one's doing here. Um, and you can see actually they've written that this set point, it should be about 48 degrees. This is 47.9, so it is perfect. It's right in that range. Um, and this obviously is a cold water exhibit. This is going to be in our northern Pacific, and that is very, very cold, 48 degrees. Uh, yeah, it's probably our giant Pacific octopus exhibit. That's our coldest exhibit at the aquarium, I believe. Actually, spider crabs might be colder. Um, how long does coral live? Great question, Finn. So if coral is kept in a healthy environment, it can live... Um, it can just keep on growing and keep on living. So individual coral polyps will not live as long, but the coral itself, because the way it works is, you know, another coral is going to build on top, build on top, build on top. So we can see that some corals that are in the ocean have been growing for thousands of years. All right. Um, how is coral born? Thank you um, from Victor. Uh, so coral can... Um, basically, they, they reproduce by releasing um, their gametes into the water, and, um, and then when they fertilize, then they will kind of settle out um, 
onto things like rocks and other structures. Um, or I believe coral can also, can they bud off also? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. We're not sure about that one. <laughs> um, do you have predators in your aquarium? Yes. So that's one of the things that we need to think about. So when we are thinking about which animals go into the exhibits, we need to make sure that we are not putting um, predators and prey together. So we're not going to put an animal that eats this little fish. We're not going to put its predator in there with it. Um, that helps us to make sure that we're able to keep all of our fish nice and healthy. We also are not going to put in animals that feed on the coral itself. Um, so we do have have an exhibit called our coral predators exhibit and there are animals that feed on coral in that exhibit but we do not have live coral in that exhibit so we have things like parrot fish um, parrot fish chew the algae off of coral and um, so we have things like parrot fish but we do not put them in the exhibit with the coral um, do different fish eat different foods? Yes, fish do. Oh, there's our parrot fish speaking up. Um, do, yes, different types of fish do eat different types of food. It just depends primarily on their mouth size. So when we look at an animal's mouth, if it has a small mouth, then it's going to eat small food. So things like plankton or worms. Um, a lot of them will also eat things like lettuce that we put into the exhibit or broccoli. Um, and then we have fish that have big mouths. They're going going to eat big food like chopped up seafood or even things like whole fish that we or whole squid that we might feed them. Very good. Um, all right. So the last thing I wanted to touch on really quickly, we've got a couple more questions, but the last thing I want to touch on is how do we care for the animals? Once we have the coral and the fish all living together, we have a couple of things that our staff have to be mindful of. They have to feed the animals and that could be by throwing the food on the top of the exhibit, or it could be by scuba diving into the exhibit and actually handing the food directly to the fish. Um, they have to monitor them for their health. So doing things Things like um, watching them, making sure their behavior is normal, making sure their body size is normal, that they're not overweight or underweight, um, making sure that, you know, if they're a fish that hides most of the time, making sure they're hiding. Um, and once they start changing their behavior, we can know that something might be wrong with them. Um, those are all things that our staff does to make sure our animals are healthy. Here we have a video of our cow nose rays being fed. They swim up this ramp and then our staff member will actually use these tongs here to deliver the food right to underneath their mouth um, or underneath their face where their mouth is. We have two last questions and then we're going to get going. Um, Rylan is wondering, what is the most popular fish? Hmm. I think a lot of people that visit the aquarium really like to see our, um, our sharks and our stingrays, which are also fish. Um, as far as like bony fish, I know that we have a puffer fish that's pretty popular. A lot of our members like to see our puffer fish. Uh, so it really just depends. But it kind of depends on what your favorite fish is. My favorite fish are trigger fish. I really like trigger fish. Uh, how do you get the fish into the exhibit? Great question. So the exhibits are all open at the top. So you will usually climb like a ladder of some sort and then it'll be open at the top. And that's how you can access it to put new fish in or to feed them or to clean the water or to climb into the exhibit, whatever it might be, they're all open on the top so that you can kind of get in there. So all right, well, thank you so much. I have had so much fun learning with all of you today. If we have any teachers out there, if you could just text us in your numbers, how many students do you have viewing? It helps us with our um, record keeping, basically, to know how many people we are reaching. So um, text us in how many students you have, and I hope that you all have a great weekend. Thank you for learning with me today. Goodbye.